Pure Encapsulations, Pure isn't just something we are. It's what we do. Clean, simple, goodness. It's a pure process with pure ingredients from start to finish. Each supplement is free from unnecessary additives and many common allergens. Because good starts with nutritional supplements that say what they do and do what they say. Our comprehensive line of supplements are built purposefully to support patient needs, from memory and mood to gastrointestinal and immune health. And it doesn't stop there. For 30 years, we've been committed to research, partnering with medical experts along the way. We've harnessed the science of nutrigenomics, worked hard to create a sustainable future, and improve the quality of life and health for children around the world. Because we believe when you do good, you feel good. That's Goodness Encapsulated. everyone. Spectrum Innovations Pure Encapsulations welcomes you to this webinar on gene nutrient interactions and mental health. May I call on Dr. Joanne San Juan to start this evening with a prayer. Uh, good evening. Uh, let us all bow down our heads to pray. Heavenly Father, once again, we are gathered here to listen, learn, and discuss on how we can better understand and process all the ailments that we can see in our patients these days. Truly, our practice has been a lot more different from years back. As we go through the journey on integrated and functional medicine, the more we realize how complex and awesome we as human beings, as his creation. Help us keep an open mind and be able to process all these informations. We thank you for the people behind these learnings, Spectrum, Pure Encapsulations, and Dr. Denise. May you bless them a thousandfold. Equip each one of us with an open mind to better understand what is happening individually to our patients, not as a protocol, but as an individualized approach. Please help us be better doctors and healers. Guide us through the entire night and may you be glorified in all that we do all honor and glory to you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, Dr. Ruby, can you please introduce? Okay, I'd like to introduce Dr. Denise Furness. Dr. Denise is an award-winning medical researcher, an international speaker, and author. 
Dr. Denise is a pioneer in the field of nutrigenomics and personalized health with almost 20 years experience. In 2012, she founded Your Genes and Nutrition and began applying her knowledge in private practice. Denise also provides education for health practitioners drawn from her own clinical trials, the latest evidence-based research, as well as government and peak health body guidelines in relation to nutrigenomics, lifestyle, and environmental medicine. Previously working in the fitness industry, Dr. Furness is certified in various modalities and uses a combined approach of genetics, biochemical markers, nutrition, and lifestyle medicine to help patients overcome health challenges, improve quality of life, and reduce the burden of disease. Dr. Furness is a retained advisor to peer encapsulations. Let's all welcome Dr. Furness. Good evening, Doctor. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. It is so nice to be back. I will share my slides with you all. Whoops, I made the slides, but I need to share them, excuse me. There we go. So this evening we are talking about mental health and we are touching on some genetics. So nutrigenomics is my favorite as a geneticist, a few key genes. And as Joanne said at the beginning, and in the prayer, you know, our, our practice has changed over the last few years. And I think mood and mental health is something that we are all dealing with with our patients. So before I start, I would like to disclose that I am a paid advisor for pure encapsulations and that I have no other conflicts of interest to disclose. So tonight we're going to talk about two key genes. Now, even if you haven't done genetic testing or perhaps even haven't had your own DNA tested, you have probably heard about MTHFR and COMPT. So in the functional medicine space, these are two common genes that have a lot of research, uh, functional effects, and can impact the way that we deal with stress and have been linked with mood imbalance and mental health. So we'll be talking about those functional genetic variations what to look for if you do do genetic testing. And even if you don't do genetic testing in your clinic, this will help you understand some of the mechanisms, some of the reasons why things like magnesium or B vitamins can be helpful because they're supporting genes like this. And we'll talk about the important nutrients that can support neurotransmitter metabolism and of course, mood balance. So let's start with the big picture, mood and mental health. So we know that mental health conditions are increasing all over the world. Depression is a leading cause of disability. Suicide is sadly the fourth leading cause of death among 15 to 29 year olds. And we do know in particular that the last few years, suicide rates have gone up, even you know, here in Australia, all over the world. And people with mental health conditions albeit they are very common, experience discrimination and stigma. So when we talk about mental health disorders, there is a wide variety of mood and mental health disorders, ranging from anxiety, eating disorders, depression, personality, you know, bipolar. And we know that these are complex and multifactorial. So there are lots of different causes. And as functional medicine practitioners, we need to look at multiple things to try to build these people back up, to build that resilience, give their body what they need so they can function at their best and get well. So when it comes to the causes, the things that we're looking for to help treat them as an individual, we know that there are particular environmental causes and, of course, genetic causes as well. So just touching on what's going on in the world or what has gone on in the world the last few years, we know that depression and anxiety went up by more than 25%. Now, this is from a report from the World Health Organization published this year in 2022, but this is only data from 2021. So they're analyzing what happened last year. So no doubt um, these figures would be a little bit different, possibly even a bit worse with the 2022 data added in. But as we can see, there was a, you know, a huge increase, 25%, and this added to the nearly 1 billion people globally who already were living with a mental health disorder. 
So anxiety is something that I'm seeing a lot of. And I have to say, I don't specialize in anxiety. In my clinic, I'm working with women's health, hormones, fertility, healthy aging. I do a lot of autoimmune. I've had thyroid issues, um, but I do look at healthy aging and helping people reduce risk of things like you know, Alzheimer's, dementia. But even though they're my areas, um, I would say, you know, almost everyone coming in, possibly I'm exaggerating, but a lot of people are now coming in with symptoms of anxiety, or even if they got off medication, now these things have come back or people are having to increase their dose of medication. So anxiety is a huge thing um, that has really been exacerbated by the pandemic. So just to remind you, and I know that everyone listening understands these things behind the mechanisms you know, the physiological biochemical changes, but just to make sure we're all on the same page, when we are thinking about anxiety, for example, there is a feared situation. So if I'm sort of up here, you can hopefully see my cursor there, a feared situation. Now that could be a real situation that someone could actually have, you know, something serious going on, their life could be threatened. And of course you have this stressful response, the adrenaline, you know, the, the hormones so that you can deal with that situation. But the reality is most of us that deal with stress or have these physiological responses aren't actually in a life-threatening situation. We are often just stressed about the pandemic, about interest rates, about, you know, food shortages, about, you know, certain stresses. And we're not actually, um, you know, we're not in a situation where we need to have that same physiological response. However, our body doesn't distinguish. So these thoughts are literally triggering that same response and we get that fight or flight. We get those, the adrenaline, you know, cortisol, things like that. And this can be exacerbated too, because people then might start feeling palpitations, feeling anxious. They think, oh, I really am, you know, dealing with something. My body is in danger. I'm in danger. And this sort of continues on. And what I'm here to talk to you about tonight is not only things that are happening in the world around us, we can't change the pandemic, but some of us genetically are predisposed to having a more exacerbated stress response or not able to deal with this situation as well because they may have inherited changes in certain genes that mean they can't clear those stress hormones. They can't metabolize, inactivate and excrete things like adrenaline at a faster rate like others can. And we'll be talking about those genes tonight. So just before I get into talking about the actual genes, I just want to mention about nutrigenomics. So nutrigenomics is basically looking at genes that interact with our diet or our nutrients and influence health. And we're looking at changes that we know affect the expression or the function of the gene, because we actually have lots of slight variations in our DNA, but not all of them cause a functional change. In the case of the genes I'm talking about tonight, though, we definitely have lots of research over years and years um, showing that there are functional changes in COMPT and MTHFR. So certain genotypes can alter protein function. And just remember that our DNA, our genes, they're the instructions. So we inherit these from our parents. They are the instructions. That's the code made up of four letters, adenine or A, thiamine T, cytosine C, and guanine um, G. So A, T, C, and G. Four letters make up our genetic code. Those instructions, then when they're read, make proteins. And those proteins can be enzymes, structural proteins, nutrient transporters. Um, they might code for hormones, neurotransmitters. So the genes are the instructions and they need to make the proteins. And if we've got genetic variations changes in the genes, that can mean there's a change in the protein. So the instructions are changed. So when we think about genotypes, so the, the genotype that you can have, so we inherit our DNA from mum and dad, so we get two. So for example, if a particular gene has a C allele, a cytosine, if we're thinking about MTHFR, it has a C and add the variance a T. So a CC would, in this case, be wild type. So this is the normal, more common one associated with normal gene function, CC. 
A heterozygote means there's one of the wild type, the most common, so-called normal, and then one variant, so CT. And I've got here major and minor. Um, you might say common and variant. It depends um, often the publications, if you're reading them in the research might say major and minor, um, but wild type, um, major, minor, uh, variant, they're, they're similar words that are used. And then homozygous refers to when we've got two of the variants, the minor allele. So not only when we are trying to identify what someone's genotype is, if they're likely to have a functional change, we also want to think about the nutrients that are required by that gene or the protein. So many proteins or enzymes require cofactors to work efficiently to catalyze that enzyme activity. And these are often minerals such as zinc, magnesium, iron, or copper. Uh, and when it comes to vitamins, it's the B vitamins. So FAD requires riboflavin, so B2, NAD, niacin, B3, methylcobalamin, so B12 is a cofactor for the one of the enzymes, methionine synthase, and the active form of B6 uh, is also a cofactor for some. So minerals and Bs are really important for lots of different enzymes all over the body. So moving on to COMPT. So this is the first gene that I want to talk to you about that really has a big influence on our neurotransmitters, particularly our catecholamines. And this is our dopamine, noradrenaline and adrenaline. So here we've got our, if we just look at the um, diagram here, we've got our catecholamines, these neurotransmitters. COMPT is the enzyme that is needed to inactivate or metabolize and break these things down. So if we're having that stress response, even if we don't feel it, sometimes people are just in a really stressed state. They just don't know how to relax. They just have, you know, higher, higher levels of some of these catecholamines. It's COMPT that we need to break them down, um, inactivate them. And to inactivate them, what this enzyme actually does, it's called catechol O methyl transferase. So this methyl, and if you came to the last webinar, you would know we talked about folate and B12 um, prescriptions and recommendations and methylation. So this is one of the genes that codes for an enzyme that uses methyl groups. So methylation. So it basically picks up a methyl group, sticks it on to the adrenaline or the dopamine, or the noradrenaline. And by doing that, it inactivates it. So it stops eliciting that stress response, stops causing that blood pressure to go up, the heart rate, you know, the liver to start pumping out glucose, you know, increased breath, um, breathing and all those things that happen when we're stressed. So COMPT is really important for clearing those neurotransmitters. So this is the actual variation. This is called an RS number. It's just an ID number, RS4680, that identifies the SNP. So if some of you have done, say, 23andMe or Ancestry, if you're looking at RS numbers, this is the actual sort of ID code for the variation. It's also commonly known VAL158MET, and that's because this is actually talking about the amino acid change. So what we would say is the, the wild type, which is a GG. This is a valine, two valine amino acids. An AG provides a valine and a methionine. And if someone inherits two variants, the homozygote, they then have um, a two methionine amino acids because this slight change, this one allele nucleotide in the DNA causes a different amino acid in that protein and that affects the function of the enzyme. So people who are GG, and this is me, no wonder I like doing things like this, you know, get that adrenaline rush, but I can clear it relatively quickly. Don't mind a bit of stress. Um, these people can clear stress um, hormones or neurotransmitters such as catecholamines at a lot of faster rate. So intermediate metabolizers clear things a little slower. And then we have our slow um, metabolizers. So when we talk about stress tolerance, the GGs are associated with better psychological tolerance to stressful situations. However, those that have the AA or the methionine allele, 
these have been associated, these people have been associated with increased nervousness, worry, and fear. So when they've got these high levels of neurotransmitters, they can get overwhelmed, they can get anxious, they're not clearing them. However, it's not all bad news. And I like to talk about this when we're doing genetics, because we don't want to just tell people, hey, you know, you're more sensitive to stress, you're more likely to get anxiety. Uh, there is a positive if you have the MET-MET. So these people actually are meant to be better at memory and attention tasks. And that is because at baseline, when they're not stressed, they do just have slightly higher uh, catecholamines. And we know that dopamine, noradrenaline and adrenaline, uh, these are all involved in memory, learning, behavior, you know, mood, things like that, you know, focus, uh, motivation. So they're able to multitask. A lot of executive CEOs um, can have this particular genotype, but if they get really stressed, it can push them over the edge a bit quicker. They can stay stressed longer and they can't clear these stress hormones as quickly. Just a quick note on estrogen metabolism, COMPT doesn't only clear those catecholamines, it also clears our catechol estrogens. And it's the same, you can be faster or slower. So you might've heard with COMPT, um, and if you haven't, um, now that you know, you'll probably start to hear it if you look a little bit in the genetics or start playing in this field of functional medicine. With COMPT, people are often sort of categorized into the warrior or warrior. So the warrior genotype, this is associated, this is the GG when people have got the valine amino acid. So their COMPT enzyme is faster. So if they are exposed to aversive or some kind of stressful stimuli, a threatening situation, they're able to deal with that a little better. However, those that have these slow COMPT, they're less efficient at that neurotransmission under stress, and they're likely to have a worse performance when under stress, and they're called the worriers. And this has also been linked with anxiety. Now, this is a relatively short talk. I'm talking about COMPT, MTHFR, a bit about methylation and nutrients. But if you don't know a lot about COMPT and you want to know more, there is lots of information out there. It's been linked with a number of mood and mental health disorders. It's not a cause. If you find this, it's not the cause, but it can be an underlying factor that you want to identify because if someone does have this SNP, they're going to need extra support, which we'll talk about. Um, so before getting on to talking about how to support and treat COMPT, um, this is just another study that is suggesting the inclusion of, this is published in 2019, of functional SNPs in relation to chronic disease. So this paper has suggested that omics, so genetics-based approaches, offer the potential to aid in identifying risk factors and understanding the biological underpinning, so these underlying causes or triggers of symptoms. And by deciphering the biological underlying factors or underpinnings of individual symptoms or symptom clusters, this has the potential to optimize precision health approaches and symptom management through the identification of at-risk individuals and targets for more personalized pharmacological or non-pharmacological, such as nutrients and supplements interventions. So basically what it's saying, and this is what we do in nutrigenomics, is we are looking for genes that are risk factors that might be an underlying cause and then treating that. So the underlying factors to help people get well. So in this case, this paper was looking for genes that are linked with anxiety, cognitive dysfunction, depression, fatigue, pain, sleep, and also positive effects. You can see their search criteria, positive, happiness, things like that. Um, so basically, this is showing you the terms they use to look at PubMed. If you don't use PubMed, you, most of you probably do, but it's our biggest database of medical and scientific literature. So they've gone in and done a search, and I believe this publication looked at all of these, all of the papers in association with genes, polymorphisms, and anxiety, and you know all these factors, up until the end of 2017. Um, and then obviously publish the paper after that. What it found is when we're looking at these things, anxiety, cognitive symptoms, et cetera, 
the genes that came up that were significant were BDNF. Now, I think over the years, I've been doing talks with you for a while now, I think we've talked about brain-derived neurotropic factor when we talked about Alzheimer's and dementia. If we didn't, um, and if you don't know what it is, it basically is something that in early development, it helps the neurons sort of develop in the brain um, in the younger years. But as we age, it actually helps us maintain our neurons. So it's really important for memory, but it has been linked with depression and mood as well. Um, if we haven't talked about it or you want to know more about it, we can talk about BDNF another time. It's definitely something I look for for my cognitive decline patients or people that are worried about age-related cognitive decline or are dealing with mood issues. Um, but just know that exercise is what can support this. So if you do have this genetic variation that has lower BDNF that can affect the neural pathways in the brain and memory and, and mood, um, exercise really lights it up and helps increase BDNF in the brain. COMPT came up and I, can, I think I can say pretty confidently, I think the most research around stress-induced mental health conditions, um, also depression, a lot of other mood disorders, it's really COMPT that comes up the most. And then there's a few other genes and a couple linking with inflammation, interleukin-6 and tumor necrosis factor alpha. But with COMPT, the SNP that I was talking about or that genetic variation, it's been linked with anxiety, cognitive symptoms, depression, pain actually. So if people have the AA, so that is the methionine, the slow variant, these people are a lot more sensitive and susceptible to pain. Um, it affects sleep, but also there can be positive effects, um, as we mentioned too, with that, you know, warrior, warrior, depending on uh, whether they're under stress or not. So moving on to MTHFR. So we talked about COMPT requiring a methyl group. So what COMPT does is it uses a methyl group to stick onto the catecholamines. So methylation is something that is influenced by this particular gene, MTHFR, and directly what this enzyme does is convert folate, a particular form of folate, I'll show you, to 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate. There is no doubt that MTHFR is probably the most studied gene. So back in the 1990s, um, the SNPs were first identified in relation to higher homocysteine and cardiovascular disease. This then led on to a lot of other studies. I started working in this area in 2003, so 19 years ago, almost 20 years ago. Um, I started working with MTHFR and methylation in, in relation to fertility and pregnancy health. So there are two variations, MTHFR 677 and 1298. And these affect enzyme activity, reduce the stability, which means it breaks down a bit faster. And it, the variations cause a change in the protein that means it doesn't bind to the cofactor um, very well. And then that affects how well it works. We know that the variations increase risk for higher homocysteine, lower folate, and that's plasma as well as whole blood. And they are less responsive to folic acid supplementation. So just to remind you where MTHFR is, and I know we've definitely talked about this in previous talks, but if you're new or you need a reminder, um, MTHFR really is the enzyme that makes 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate. Now we can obviously supplement with this, very popular in functional medicine. Um, it is the predominant form of folate in our blood, about 80% of the folate inside us that's circulating is in the form of 5-methyl. And if we eat food, we get various forms of folate, but 5-methyl, again, is the predominant source. So if we um, sort of look at this whole pathway, there's 5-10-methylene tetrahydrofolate. This can actually go off somewhere else, um, sort of to another side. And obviously, this is a very small section of the metabolic pathway. We've simplified it just to sort of highlight the MTHFR and, and this side of the pathway, the methylation. But there is another side that really supports DNA synthesis. So this form of folate can go off and help create um, nucleotides, DNA bases, and is involved in DNA synthesis. Or MTHFR catalyzes 
this form of folate making 5-methyl. So it pushes the folate over to 5-methyl. And then this is the form of folate that methylates homocysteine. So this is why it's directly linked with homocysteine because this is the form of folate that needs to give its methyl group, um, which is shown here, to homocysteine. And once that's stuck on, homocysteine becomes methionine. Methionine can then make S-adenosyl methionine, often called samine. And this is the universal methyl donor for methylation reactions all over the body. So this can be for here, we can see PEMPT, we should have COMPT there as well. So this methyl groups for COMPT to break down adrenaline, methyl groups for PEMPT to make choline, methyl groups to sit on our DNA to help with gene expression. So methylation throughout the body. So when it comes to MTHFR, just to highlight the strong association with folate, um, there was a review published quite a while ago now, but back in 2015 in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. So this would be one of our top nutrition journals. Um, and this is actually something that the World Health Organization does quote in relation to the likelihood of someone being low in folate, and that can affect things like neural tube defects. Um, so just to give you a quick summary of this review, it assessed the association between MTHFR 677 and folate. It looked at literature from 1992 all the way to 2014, and it showed there was a consistent difference, percentage difference in serum and plasma, so that S&P serum and plasma, and red blood cell folate across the MTHFR genotypes. So CC, there, you know, that, that's normal. So CC is the, the wild type. When someone had a CT, like one, one of the variants, they had a little bit lower folate. And then when they had the TT, it was significant lower. So percentage difference. So if they were heterozygote or homozygote, they had a greater um, reduction in folate levels. And then they go on to say that lower blood folate concentrations associated with this polymorphism, so MTHFR, could have implications for population risk um, of things like neural tube defects. But as we know, folate isn't just important for neural tube defects. Folate and homocysteine are important for the brain, for neurotransmitters in relation to, to mood and cognitive health and other areas as well, cardiovascular disease, et cetera. So just to talk a little bit more about MTHFR. So this is sort of representing the gene, this is the five prime end for those that know a bit about genetics, here's the five prime end. And if we're sort of looking here at the gene, we've got at position 677, people can be a C or a T. If they're homozygous, this means they've got two Ts, two variants, they are likely to have 25% enzyme activity. So really low, no wonder it's linked with lower folate because it's not converting to that 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate, and that's the predominant form in the blood. A heterozygote, which is a CT, is associated with almost 70% enzyme activity. And then the 1298, that does not have such a strong effect, but it definitely has some effect. The homozygote has about a 60% um, enzyme activity, so 40% reduction, and about a 20% reduction, so 80%, just over 80% with the heterozygote. And another thing to look out for if you do do testing with MTHFR is the compound heterozygote. So compound heterozygote means that heterozygote in the 677 and the 1298. So we've got a CT, CT in MTHFR and an AC in the 1298. That's compound heterozygote and that's linked with about 50% um, of enzyme activity. So if you do do testing, um, if you don't, um, may not need this, but I've actually put this together. I put it together a little while ago because a lot of practitioners ask me not just about, you know, the compound heterozygote, but what are the combinations? Because most of the time, if you're testing, you've got results for 677 and 1298. So if they're a wild type and a wild type normal, that's 100% enzyme activity. If it's a CC and a heterozygote, you know, just one change in the 1298, which obviously has less of an effect, that's only about a 10 to 20% reduction. Normal here, 
and um, the homozygote, we've got about 60% enzyme activity, which I mentioned in, in the previous slide. And then when we get into the heterozygotes of the 677, with the wild type of 1298, it's about 65% enzyme activity. The compound heterozygote that I just mentioned, that's about 50% enzyme activity. When you get to the CT and the CC, so the variant, the homozygote for the variant MTHFR, this is extremely rare. I don't think you're ever going to see this. Um, that's about a 30% enzyme activity, probably not compatible with life. Um, and, I have, and I've tested thousands. Not only do I work in clinic where I've done, you know, hundreds of testings with individuals, I've worked in large research studies where, you know, I've had cohorts of, you know, in Adelaide, 1,600, New Zealand, 3,000, you know, Manchester, we, we did some international work. So I've looked at thousands and thousands of people's, um, you know, genotypes with MTHFR and other methylation-related SNPs, and I have um, never come across this. So the TT and the AA, you do see this. This is when you've got the TT of 677 and the normal of 1298. That's about a 30 to 40% reduction. The TT and AC, again, now this has come up once in the thousands and thousands of genetic testing data that I've seen or analyzed. Um, I've seen this once and I almost wonder if it was a lab error. Um, it was from a sample from overseas when I was doing research. Um, and the TT and the CC, that is not compatible with life. So, you know, if you, from a fertility aspect too, if you've got, you know, parents with TTs and, and um, Cs, you know, that can, that can cause difficulty from a fertility aspect. If you don't do genetic testing and you didn't need all that information, I apologize. But once you start looking at genetics and you want to know about MTHFR, it's often the first gene people start with because there is so much evidence. We know it affects folate. We know that you can do something about it as a practitioner. You can give folate. You can give the cofactor, you know, that B2 to help it. You can support methylation. So it's often one we start with, and this slide may be of benefit for you. But with MTHFR, it's not just about the folate side of things and methylation. And this is from um, if, you, if you want to know more about it, this is from a paper, Translational Psychiatry, talking about sort of folate and MTHFR. We know that folate's needed to make those methyl groups, so supporting methylation, and those methyl groups are needed for things like COMPT. So if we've got low folate or issues with MTHFR linking with low folate, that can affect methylation needed for COMPT. But it can also affect DNA synthesis, and also folate is actually linked with biopterin. Now in this particular paper, and I do hear it a lot, some of you might know about this as well. They do say that MTHFR is linked directly with biopterin. Now it's, it's not a direct link, it's actually a different enzyme, dihydrofolate reductase. Um, and I believe the type of folate that's more linked with biopterin is actually dihydrofolate, not 5-methyl. But regardless, um, folate can impact biopterin levels, BH4, and that's a cofactor for tyrosine hydroxylase, which we, we know needs to convert tyrosine to L-dopa, which then makes our dopamine, noradrenaline, gets converted to adrenaline. Uh, and biopterin is also a cofactor for tryptophan, tryptophan hydroxylase. So obviously our tryptophan going towards serotonin, and this can affect neurotransmitters and mood as well. So folate is definitely important. And if someone's got an MTHFR SNP, it's likely that they're going to need more folate from the diet or possibly supplement. But when we think about the big picture too, it's not folate on its own. We need to think about you know, other cofactors like B12, um, things like that to support methylation, which we are moving into. So what is methylation? If you've been coming along to the talks and you know working in functional medicine, you probably do have a good idea, but Basically, methylation is a methyl group, which is a carbon, so one carbon with three hydrogens to make it stable. It's a, um, a methyl group that is then basically added on to it, attached to something. So if it's attached to adrenaline, that inactivates it, it changes the function. Or if it's attached to, you know, um, metabolites of arsenic, you know, it helps with the detox, detoxification, you know, getting rid of it. It can be attached to 
catechol, estrogens, re other reactive compounds. Um, so methyl groups are something that basically help change the function, often breaking things down, sometimes involved in the synthesis of things as well. But basically they're attached to proteins, lipids, DNA for gene expression. And really just when we say methylation, it is the addition of that methyl group onto something. And that then changes the function. So methylation is really known for importance in relation to cell membrane function and, and integrity. And that's probably a little bit more to do with the choline side of things as well. It's involved in neurotransmitter synthesis, um, not just acetylcholine, but um, neurotransmitter balance and metabolism, particularly with the catecholamines that we've discussed, epigenetics. So it can sit on DNA, regulating gene expression and actually helping make um, nucleotides, DNA bases such as thymine, and are also involved in detoxification. So it's involved in many different areas in the body. One of those fundamental underlying pathways that needs to be working properly to help multiple things and can affect brain health, cardiovascular health, fertility, etc. So getting back to COMPT, I've told you what it does. It actually inactivates these um, particular catecholamines. It's really important for managing our stress response. It impacts our um, neurotransmitters that directly influence our mood. But we need to know what we can do if someone has these SNPs. Well, the first thing we want to do is think, do we need to support methylation? It requires a methyl group. But the other thing to note is that the cofactor for COMPT is magnesium. Magnesium is what binds to COMPT and actually helps it function. And there is, I only know of one study, but there is one study that showed that people that drank magnesium rich water, so had higher magnesium levels from drinking mineral water with magnesium actually had higher um, COMPT activity from that extra magnesium. We don't have a lot of studies on it, um, but some, some evidence that magnesium does increase enzyme activity. And as I said, it's, it's needed. So if you're deficient in magnesium, it's gonna affect COMPT. If you're deficient in your Bs or folate, it'll affect it. And then of course, if you've got that genetic variation as well. So we've talked about COMPT, how important methylation is. I spoke about MTHFR, the key enzyme that pulls folate over towards the methylation side. Now, the other pathway I showed you was a really nice simplified one from Pure. This is something that I published many years ago. Um, and this is sort of showing you over here too. We've got that DNA synthesis side. And we talked about this in the last talk as well. When we did the folate and B vitamin um, recommendations and prescribing. So there's this DNA synthesis, synthesis side. But I wanted to show you this one too, because it just does give you a little bit more of the pathway and clearly highlight some of the cofactors like B12 that are important. Because even though MTHFR can push to 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate, if someone's deficient in B12, that can mean that that methyl group doesn't get added to homocysteine. So for this to move on to homocysteine, it has to go via these other enzymes and that requires B12. And in addition, um, B2, B6 and things like that can be helpful, but really thinking about your folate and your B12. And a lot of people tend to be lower in B12. That's one of the big issues. So looking out for that because that can affect methylation. I also just want to touch on stress. Now, I think every one of you listening will probably know what I'm about to say, but it's just a reminder to communicate with our patients, particularly right now, when people are feeling anxious, people are struggling to deal with stress. So there are different types of stress. Not all stress is bad. And that is definitely the message I want to get across to you. So we have eustress. That's the positive stress. You know, that's the stress I've got now, right? Oh my God, I'm doing a presentation. You know, when you get up in front of people, when you do something new, you go for a job interview, you know, I don't know, you're going to run a race, bungee jumping, something. That's eustress. You know, you get nervous. You do have a stress response but actually it doesn't last too long. You feel good after it and all the you know, happy hormones come along as well. Acute stress is different to you stress in that it's not necessarily associated with a positive outcome, not pushing yourself to grow or develop or you know, increase your, your resilience. 
It's more that you have had a, you know, a little scare. You've seen a spider, something like that. But, you know, humans can actually have multiple um, episodes of acute stress throughout the day. You can turn on that stress response, turn it off. The main thing is that you're turning it off, turning it on, not staying on because it's the chronic stress, as we all know, that is the one that is dangerous to our health. And then obviously distress. So that feeling of overwhelm when we just don't feel like we have the ability physically, mentally, emotionally to cope. And it's the negative stress that can impact performance, affects our adrenals, anxiety, et cetera. So I know that all of you listening would be aware of this, but I feel like people are starting to get scared of stress. And when you start bringing in genetics into your clinic or talking to people about stress and saying, you know, you might need more magnesium or bees, or you've inherited a gene that means you don't tolerate stress as well, you know, that, that big increase in adrenaline, people can start to think, oh my God, you know, I don't want to get stressed. And then they start to hide from the world that can cause them more anxiety. They are not putting themselves out there. We are made to deal with stress. It's, it's the issue of this constant, you know, the thoughts and the chronic stress that's the issue. Because if we don't have a little bit of stress, then how can we get better? How can we challenge ourselves? How can we reach our goals? How can we continue to grow? So I just want to remind everyone to check in with your patients and check that they understand good stress and bad stress and not to be scared of stress and reminding them that the belief and mindset plays a big role. So if they say, oh, you know what? It's normal to be stressed about this. Get over it. Just all, you know, it's it's okay. Or I can challenge myself. And I bring this up too, because I've had moments when I was recovering from my autoimmune disease. You know, before COVID, I used to travel overseas a lot. And I love it. I love it. I love it. Sophie, Denise, she's there from Hong Kong. I think, you know, you know, been over there into the Philippines and, you know, into Hong Kong. And, you know, I love, I love meeting people. I love traveling, but there was a a point in my life where I thought I'm going to have to stop this because it's causing me too much stress because, you know, I remember once, I think it was an event in the USA, you know, I could feel the stress hormones coming and I thought, oh, this is not good. You know, I'm not well at the moment. I've had autoimmune thyroid things in the past. I thought this is just stressing me out. This is not good. I need to, I need to stop doing this. But the truth is, I love this stuff. Yes, it causes me stress, but I feel like this is my calling. You know, this is my passion. If I didn't do that, I don't necessarily think I would be happy. So I'm reminding you as practitioners too, because we deal with stress as well. And we have to put ourselves out there, learning new things, getting up, speaking, but also to our patients, because we don't want people to retreat. We don't want people to hide from the world. That's not going to make them better. We want them to understand the differences in stress. And actually, when we think about the type of things we do to help people deal with stress and anxiety and mental health conditions, you know, things that are really popular right now are things like cold showers. So what's a cold shower doing? It's turning on your stress response. You know, it's trying to, it's, it's a little stress that you know, isn't that bad for you, but it just, you know, a minute of that cold you're building resilience. And that's what we want people to do, to build resilience, not be scared of stress, understand it can come and go and give them support. You know, things like the magnesium or the bees if they need it, or, you know, other other nutrients, um, other lifestyle interventions, things like that. And as I said, you know, just reminding our patients that stress is necessary for them to increase, that should say resilience, not resistance, (laughs) um, and to develop and to be our best. Believing that all stress is bad, and I feel like in the world right now, everyone's thinking that stress is bad, is going to cause more issues with that anxiety. People can start to get scared of stress, stressed about stress, and we don't want that. All right, getting on to our nutrients. So magnesium is definitely one of my favorites. Um, And I want you to know that it's not just a cofactor for COMPT. It's not just going to help drive COMPT to break down those stress hormones. It's actually involved in over 300 enzyme reactions. So if someone's low in magnesium, it's likely to be affecting multiple things, not just, you know, stress. It helps regulate blood pressure, blood sugar. And again, if we're thinking about mood imbalance, you know, regulating blood sugars is really important. 
and of course, regulating our stress response through directly impacting COMPT. It's also been shown to help with sleep, so reducing insomnia and restless leg syndrome. And a study um, suggested that 500 milligrams of magnesium, which I think is a pretty lowish dose. I'm pretty comfortable. I'm not sure about you listening, but I'm comfortable giving up to, um, you know, um, one gram, depending on the person. Of course, it can cause loose bowels and things like that. It depends. But um, yeah, 500 milligrams compared to placebo for eight weeks improved sleep quality. So the types that I recommended, I'm often asked, you know, what magnesium do I give? So I used to be a big fan of magnesium citrate. Um, it's quite good if people are constipated. You know, I'm often dealing with a lot of people who need to get their bowels moving. Um, magnesium glycinate can be a bit more gentle. But there is research now showing that magnesium malate um, may actually be better absorbed and more bioavailable. And in a sense, that makes sense because the citrate, like the oxide, you know, it is the one that really, really helps with the bowel. So it probably is just going through people. So this is um, a study. So this is published back in 2019, animal model, model, but comparing different forms of magnesium. And what it showed is that the magnesium malate had the highest bioavailability bio compared to magnesium oxide and magnesium citrate. And these are the two I'm probably thinking about for constipation. Um, and then there was also another form that I um, don't know, I've not used, magnesium acetyl taurate. Um, this was the second most bioactive. And they said that that actually showed getting into the brain and reducing anxiety. But uh, I believe that you have the magnesium malate in the Philippines as well. You can, you can access that one. I'm not going to spend a long time talking about methylation, uh, support folate and bees, because you had a whole talk on that uh, only a few months ago from me. And if you didn't see it, I'm sure you can speak to um, Spectrum or Sophie or Denise or Gyra Health over in Hong Kong. They would be able to give you the recording. Um, but just to summarize, remembering that with folate, um, if we are thinking about supporting methylation, consider the 5-methyl form. Remember the MTHFR. When it's slowing down folate um, or that conversion, it's the 5-methyl. Generally, a maximum of one milligram. Use your discretion. You know, as a practitioner, you may have the odd patient where you think I need to give much higher doses, but that's definitely not my norm. I'm usually looking somewhere between 500 micrograms to a milligram, but often just the 500 micrograms or somewhere between that and, and one milligram. Um, if they're a sensitive patient, they react. We talked about this last time too, um, starting at lower doses and just being cautious. So B12. So B12, you don't want to give folate without B12. And if they're sensitive or you're worried, I would start with B12 first. Consider methylcobalamin, adenosylcobalamin or hydroxy. And as far as I know, um, I think both Hong Kong and the Philippines can get all of those forms, which is fantastic. Um, you know, unlike the um, folate that we're sort of talking about into the milligrams here, we're really talking about the, you know, the micrograms, usually lower. Um, but yeah, doses of, of those, uh, the, the adenosyl, I think if you remember last time, I actually showed a paper that suggested that 1500 micrograms of B12 was suggested. This was in the clinical, the European Journal of Clinical Nutrition. It said 1500 micrograms of both adenosyl and methyl was shown to help increase um, B12 and, and shown to be as effective as actually B12 injections or shots for those that were low in B12. So it was suggesting around that 1500 micrograms. I think anywhere between you know, a thousand to, to high, maybe 2000, depending on the person. Again, you might go higher dose for some people. Some people do benefit from, from the higher amounts, but always starting low and slow, particularly if they're sensitive. B6 can be helpful. B2, choline and zinc are other cofactors in the methylation pathway. So possibly, you know, either thinking about a B complex um, or folate and, you know, B12 and possibly B6, they're the, the big players. 
Now, I haven't talked about inflammation much in this talk. We've really focused on two key genes, two key genes that I think are a good start if you want to look for susceptibility, risk factors to help people understand what might be going on or making them more susceptible to sort of stress and mood disorders. But we can't not talk about the omega-3s because there is so much inflammation, inflammation, <laughs> information around inflammation, the brain linking with depression and, and cognitive decline disorders. And the omega-3s can really help. So they're anti-inflammatory. They're required for cellular and brain health. You know, DHEA is, you know, the most of it is, is in the brain. Dosages is quite varied, you know, EPA and DHA from 1.5 to 5 grams. Um, I'm generally thinking, you know, probably at least one. That's probably a low dose for me. If you have it um, in the Philippines and Hong Kong, I like the one omega, pure encapsulations, one omega. That's got... Uh, I think it's 600 um, milligrams of um, EPA, 400 of DHA. Um, it's, you know, in one capsule, you've got that much. It's good. So people don't have to take, you know, like six capsules. They can, you know, just have a couple and they're getting 2000 um, milligrams um, or two grams of the um, EPA and DHA for those omegas. You know, another thing that we haven't talked much about, but when we talk about mood, mental health, um, anxiety, you know, a lot of these people are dealing with pain, you know, they're not sleeping properly because they've got pain. They're in that fight and flight. They can't relax. They can't, you know, get into that parasympathetic state, that rest and digest to heal or to feel better or to reduce, you know, these stress, anxiety symptoms because they're in pain. So they're on this sort of um, in this reactive state. So omega-3s have been shown to help with pain management. Um, this is a study that I may have presented in one of the talks a few years ago, talking about inflammation, um, but it was published back in 2006. So not a new one, but it showed that people that had chronic pain that were taking prescription non-steroidal anti-inflammatories um, were able to substitute fish oil. Um, on average, they were taking the fish oil for 75 days almost all of them, about 80% were taking 1,200 milligrams and then 22% were taking higher 2,400 milligrams of essential fatty acids. Didn't split the DHA EPA, but total here. Nearly 60% discontinued their prescription, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories for pain. 60% said their overall pain and joint pain had improved. 80% said they were satisfied. 88% said they'd stay on the fish oil and there were no side effects. So, you know, obviously when we're thinking about these mood and mental health disorders, you know, I'm giving you one pathway, the methylation, a couple of key SNPs. But remember when I pulled out that paper that talked about the key genes that were linked with anxiety, depression, cognitive symptoms, pain, sleep, there were a couple of genes that, that increase risk for chronic inflammation or for someone sort of being pro-inflammatory, having higher cytokines. That was a TNF alpha and interleukin-6. So thinking about omega-3s, I think um, in Asia, you tend to have a much better diet with sort of seafood and more omega-3s, but here in Australia, it's not part of our diet. I do give most of my patients omega-3s. And the last thing I want to mention is um, some amino acids. So when we're talking about balancing our neurotransmitters, you know, we do need to have the basic building blocks. So just checking that your patients are getting enough protein in their diet, if they're not maybe even thinking about a protein powder, sometimes I do that depending on the patient. Um, we know glycine is important for making serotonin, also affecting sleep and mood, L-theanine, so you know from certain teas, even mushrooms, um, tryptophan, of course, again with serotonin um, and GABA, which you can obviously supplement with. I tend not to give GABA as a supplement. I try to just make sure people are getting enough of the, you know, the, the amino acids protein in their diet, but GABA can also come from fermented foods as well. And not only are these building blocks helping us with providing what we need to, you know, make these neurotransmitters for calming, for sleep, but also help regulate blood sugar, which as I mentioned before, is something you need to look at in your patients that are having, you know, mood issues. And the last thing I want to mention, we've talked about, you know, some of the nutrients, two key genes that have a huge functional effect that can affect mood, um, methylation, but also just remembering that 
you know, the diet's important, the supplements are important, but what can we do from a lifestyle perspective too? It's obviously functional medicine. We need to address things at different levels. And this is a paper I came across a few years ago um, and I was reminded about it and I wanted to bring it in here, just showing you the benefits of meditation. You know, you might actually give your patients some magnesium and they might say, oh, I'm sleeping a bit better. I feel a bit better, but that's not actually enough for them to really reverse that anxiety or feel better. We all know that it's generally not as simple as just having a supplement. Yes, we need to provide these things, but thinking about the lifestyle things too, some things that can actually help them get out of that fight or flight, get out of that sympathetic state. So they can get into the parasympathetic state. They can relax. They can heal. Hormones are balanced. Neurotransmitters are balanced. And meditation is something that has lots of research um, showing it can help and increasing important things like GABA, you know, calming, melatonin for sleep, serotonin for gut health, digestive health, you know, mood, reducing cortisol, reducing adrenaline um, and, you know, and, and endorphins. So in summary, when we think about our phenotype, so our phenotype is what you're expressing. So if you are depressed or you are anxious or you have high homocysteine or cardiovascular disease or, you know, or you're healthy, you know, this is what you're expressing right now, a snapshot. And this can change your phenotype. Some phenotypical things don't change your eye color, your height. Well, as we age, sometimes we get a bit shorter, but some, you know, when we think about phenotype, it's not just the traits that we express as in eye color, hair color, height. It's also the disease and the health status we have. And this is influenced by our genes. So our genetic makeup that predisposes us to certain conditions or needing more nutrients, but of course our environment as well. And we know we can't change our genes, but if you know that you're someone who needs more folate, you can change that with diet or supplements. If you're someone that knows that you're likely to have, you know, an issue dealing with stress, you know, you can become overwhelmed quicker. You can't manage your stress hormones as well. Well, what can we do? We can give you more magnesium. We can talk to you about strategies, tools to manage your stress. Make sure you're not low in your B vitamins. Um, you know, actually there's a supplement here in Australia, a popular one that's called executive stress and it's just B vitamins. And as I said, even if you don't do genetics, sometimes it's good just to know what's going on in the body, why those B vitamins are important for breaking down and clearing these stress hormones. And that's for methylation and that enzyme COMPT that literally inactivates and breaks these stress hormones down. So in summary, mood and mental health disorders are a global concern. Causes are multifactorial. We need to look at different things. Tonight, we've touched on a few key genes, a few key pathways. Compton and MTHFR, if you're just getting into genetics, are two things you want to look for. I can assure you there is tons of research for these. Um, there's obviously lots of other genes, but you want to start with the ones that have a lot of um, information. There are also two genes that you can do something about with nutrition. So, you know, you don't want to test for something and then you say, well, we're not sure how to change that. So with COMPT, you know, looking at the magnesium, the Bs, with MTHFR, we know the folate, you know, the other Bs for methylation. We know that nutritional therapy can compensate for these inherited genetic variations, supporting methylation, neurotransmitter metabolism, improving sleep, like we said with the magnesium as well, and stress management. So I thank you for your time. Uh, once again, Dr. Denise, uh, you never cease to amaze us with those uh, wonderful lectures. Now you can type your uh, question in the chat box or you can unmute yourself so you can ask the question directly. Uh, we now have uh, this question from the chat box uh, from Dr. Amiliora. Which type of magnesium does help best with COMT? So I guess it's any magnesium that the person will tolerate because it's not really what it's bound to. It's getting the magnesium in, but it does look like there we are getting some evidence to suggest that magnesium malate, which I believe um, maybe Sophie can answer that you do have in the Philippines. Um, so that I do tend to use a little bit of the citrate and the glycinate, um, but a lot of that is to do with bowels. If we're thinking about stress and anxiety, 
um, the malate's probably a good form. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know if you do testing. We do a little bit of testing here, but even looking at magnesium levels, magnesium is one of those things that in some people it just doesn't tend to go up. So the magnesium citrate, I do find that sometimes the levels aren't going up um, and then I might try a different form. Um, but I've only just started using the, the magnesium malate recently. Uh, what about uh, magnesium threonate? Yeah, I don't use it. My, as I said, it was probably, I started out when I first started in sort of integrative medicine about 10 years ago, my mentor was always using magnesium citrate. So I used that for probably the first five years or so, and then started with the glycinate, which I thought was a little bit better for calming. Um, and now onto the um, malate. So I, I haven't used that one. Very happy for your input there, Joanne, if you want to mention, you know, your experience with it. Uh, accordingly, uh, magnesium threonate crosses the blood-brain barrier better than the other forms. Mm. And uh, there is one speaker who, who advised that uh, because according to you, mm. magnesium is, uh, we cannot really monitor how, how it is elevated in terms of blood testing. Uh, he recommended a uh, using different brands of magnesium, let's say magnesium glycinate in the morning and then magnesium citrate at night. So you mm. combine different brands. Mm, mm. Yeah, I um, yeah, definitely have had to try. As I said, the citrate, I realized in some people, the levels weren't going up. And actually that study I showed that said the malate um, was the most bioavailable and better absorbed. The other form, um, Torate, I think it was, it did show that that was faster at getting into the brain. I believe the malate did as well. I might have to go back to the paper, but um, yeah, different forms get into different areas at different rates, including the brain or other tissues. So, yeah. Uh, from uh, Dr. Denise, Tam, in terms of blood work, what should we be looking for depression and anxiety? Mm, so, I guess with, with blood, I like, and I think you have it, but I do like doing um, organic acid testing. So that's not a blood, that is a urine test, but I'm actually looking at metabolites of adrenaline or, you know, epinephrine, um, dopamine, things like that. So looking at actual neurotransmitter levels, getting an idea. If you're just doing standard bloods though, and you don't have access to the functional tests or you know, I know they can be a bit more expensive, harder to get overseas. Um, you know, even something like a homocysteine because yeah. it does link with that methylation and that's a little bit easier to get. You know, that's a good indication. And if there's a problem with homocysteine, then, you know, let's say it's, you know, it's quite high or in the case of being low, it's still a building block to get around to make methionine. So if that's out of range, then there's likely a methylation issue, which is then going to, you know, be affecting the COMPT as well as folate and the other pathways as well. So homocysteine is an easy one. Um, and yeah, with the neurotransmitters, as I said, I do like to do the oat test. Um, if, if you have access to that one, that's a bit of a standard one that we do here. Uh, from Dr. Alcaraz, when do we consider testing for COMP and MPHFR? Mm. So if your patient's coming to you and, you know, they're, it depends. For me, I guess I'm a little bit different. I do genetics with everyone. That's what I'm known for. I'm a geneticist, but obviously that's not the case with everyone. Um, I will also just say that pure, pure encapsulations have pure genomics. I noticed on that little one minute video, you know, it said it's harnessing nutrigenomics. I'm guessing that you will all get access to that very soon. So pure genomics, if you don't know about it already, um, it's actually a free platform and you can run your 23andMe or Ancestry data. So if you've done 23andMe or Ancestry um, to look at, you know, Ancestry information, you can get that data and run it through. It's um, free, assuming it'll be free for everyone else. It's free in the US. We don't have it here in Australia yet. Um, but if you've got that, then people can, you know, obviously do that at, at a much more affordable price because some of the genetic testing, even what I do in Australia is quite expensive. So because it's, you know, generally an added expense, you may just want to consider it if someone's either not getting better or 
they just want to understand more and explore. Like they want to go down that functional medicine pathway and find out the underlying causes. Because sometimes I feel that with genetics, it's not just, or, or, or there's some of these SNPs, it's not just directing you from a treatment perspective and saying, oh, this is why we might need to give you more magnesium, or this is why you're going to possibly need more, more folate, or maybe you're not responding because you've been having some other forms of supplements. Sometimes it actually just kind of takes the pressure off people and they go, I'm not crazy. And actually now I just understand that I'm actually more sensitive to stress. So I actually have to work harder at doing my meditation. I need to stop blaming someone at work or my husband or this or that, you know, it's, it's a level of understanding and a connection to themselves. Cause sometimes I think people are not connected to who they are. So it's saying, this is who I am. We all have genetic strengths and weaknesses this is a so-called weakness that I need to work on if I want to be truly well. So it's a level of understanding if they're that kind of patient. And I'm guessing if you do functional medicine, the people that see you want to know, not everyone wants to know. Some people just want a supplement, just want a pill, but there are people that will want to actually get that understanding, truly want to get well. Um, and they're the ones that will, will you know, love it. Some people find it really, really beneficial. Okay, thank you for that. From Dr. Barut Barutil, uh, do we need to add a separate B12 folate supplementation if patient is already on complete B-complex uh, by Pure and Top for patients with high home sustain? Mm -hmm. um, generally, I would say no. The B-complex is often enough. But again, consider the individual. You know, do they have you know, major digestive issues, you know, B12 is very hard to absorb, you know, B12 and iron are those things that are affected by the pH, you know, with B12, it's actually, you know, the biggest vitamin, um, it requires intrinsic factor, you know, other things to get it across. So if there's, if they've got digestive issues, um, maybe they've been, you know, low in B12 in the past, perhaps you might want to add on a little bit of extra B12, um, or if you do see the MTHFR and they tell you, you know, their diet's not great, they're not having a lot of, you know, leafy greens or something. But in general, I would say you don't, but, you know, ask those questions. I mean, I say digestive issues. I feel like not only do most of our patients have anxiety these days, most of them have digestive issues. So a lot of them might need a bit of extra B12. But yeah, consider the individual. I wouldn't say that every single person needs extra B12 and folate. Uh, as follow-up question to that, how often should we monitor hom homocysteine in a patient? Mm. Well, I love testing. Um, you know, ideally, if, you know, it, it, people can afford it and it's, it's accessible, you might start them on a supplement and then, you know, retest in three months. Um, maybe not every three months, but three months is enough time to really see a difference, you know, assuming they're being compliant and taking their supplements. Um, if three months is, is difficult, depending on time and money, then maybe, you know, within six months, I wouldn't be, wouldn't be leaving at that. And then once you've got to sort of a maintenance level, if they're coming back and they're seeing you for sort of routine, you know, healthy aging, things like that, then once a year. Um, and, and this is assuming that you've, you've got them to a point that you're happy with those levels. That would be just checking in. Obviously, if they're, if they're not responding, you know, you might be doing more testing or, you know, more changes with protocols, things like that. And if they're not responding to the B-complex or the folate B12, that's when you want to start to think about choline. It's rare, but occasionally people don't respond to the Bs and maybe there's a, an issue with choline um, because we know that with homocysteine, I've shown you the methylation pathway, sort of the MTHFR and the, the methylfolate with homocysteine. But remember there is, um, or if you don't know, there's another enzyme called BHMT, betaine homocysteine methyltransferase. So betaine, which comes from choline, also methylates our homocysteine. Um, that's that's another, another pathway to think about. So um, choline can be helpful if they're not responding Okay, from uh, Dr. Alcaraz, is, is, is there a problem with over-methylating a patient? 
Yeah, I mean, I think there is a problem with, you know, going really high dose with anything. And I'm definitely a little bit cautious, you know, in my early days, you know, when I worked in the public hospital in a fertility aspect, I did give very high doses, you know, all of our high risk patients were on five milligrams of folate, very high doses of B12. Like the uh, person asked before, we had them on B complexes plus folate plus B12. We did a lot. Um, I have to say we did have good outcomes though from a fertility perspective, but then as the years went on and I didn't know about integrative medicine 20 years ago, I was working in a, in a public hospital and I'd been trained in a, um, you know, just the routine, you know, nutrition, things like that. And um, things started happening though, like we had a few papers, we don't know yet, but there was a big research study that came out that suggested, you know, high, high folate may be linked with autism. So we started pulling back in the high risk clinic, giving so much folate. Then as you start to learn about the, you know, the epigenetic side of things and, you know, you realize that you are causing a lot of shifts when you give high doses. Um, so I tend not to give high doses and getting to your question with the over methylating, I think that really just does come from giving too much. And if you didn't catch the last webinar, I talked about some of the side effects that can come with giving methylated supplements. And we think it may be due to, um, with folate, if you look at the chemical composition, it's made up of, it's a polyglutamate. You know, there is glutamate and some people are sensitive to glutamate. You know, it's an excitatory neurotransmitter. So if you're giving someone lots of folate, there's a possibility that that could be causing some of these symptoms. Um, so there's a few different things. We don't really know what, what, how, or why some people, it's definitely the minority, but the ones that do experience these symptoms of, you know, possibly over methylation, because it can cause that they can't sleep, anxiety, you know, heart rate, things like that. Often these are people though, that are very sensitive to other things, foods, smells, other supplements. And in those cases, um, all my sensitive patients, I'm always starting with low dose and building up. And you may even want to think about one supplement at a time, not a B complex, you know, start with B12, build up um, before adding in your folates or before thinking about a B complex. So you know how they're responding to those things. Uh, majority of uh, uh, supposed to be folate vitamins available in the Philippine market is in folic acid form. Now, what is the difference uh, mm. of the metabolism of folate versus folate, especially among pregnant women? Mm. Can I go back to my, um, my, will it work if I go back to it? Yes, please. Because this is a lot of the work that my early work that I did, um, looking at the difference and looking at the supplements and the genetics. So um, what you can see here is at the top, we have folic acid. And by the way, the first 10 years of my life working in this area, I gave folic acid. I didn't even know about 5-methyl. I've only been giving 5-methyl since 2012, really. So, so 10 years. So the first 10 years, um, and I believe at that time, there was only folic acid, but so, and, and we had success. So I'm not anti-folic acid at all because I saw benefit in my pregnant population. But the issue with folic acid is it is synthetic. And in a sense, for fortifying food and supplements, that's a good thing. It's more stable. It's easier to transport it. You know, it's, it's, it's more stable, um, better for, you know, supplements and fortifying foods. But because it's more stable, it's harder to metabolize. And there's an enzyme here called dihydrofolate reductase. It has to go through that twice. Um, and then it gets makes this tetrahydrofolate. This is the active form. So folic acid isn't active. It's an inactive form that needs to go through an enzyme twice. And if someone has issues with that enzyme, sometimes they can have SNPs. I mean, it doesn't have such a big effect like MTHFR, but there are some SNPs in DHFR. Um, or let's say they got chronic fatigue, you know, people that have got issues even just with ATP and, and energy because all of our enzymes need that. Um, the other thing is if you have really high folate, it's what we call saturates the enzyme. It's, it just, it, it's, it can't convert anymore. So it is a little bit harder for the body. And then if someone has, as an enzyme in here, SHMT, if someone's got SNPs in DHFR, SHM, 
MST, MTHFR, it's just a little bit more difficult to metabolize folate. So if you are someone who is a bit sensitive or you're trying to give them a more natural form or they've got SNPs, then the 5-methyl may be better. Now I'm saying that from my knowledge, my you know clinical observation from a, a scientific research publication, clinical guidelines, we don't have that information here in Australia. <laughs> Our clinical guidelines still state give folic acid. Um, without taking up too much of your time, I, I was trying to help sort of change our clinical guidelines. NHMRC is our over, overarching body for creating our dietary guidelines, supplements for doctors. And um, we need more randomized controlled trials. Um, but without going into all the details, it's probably not going to happen. We went to ethics. That's when I still had a lab and we're still doing research. And I was saying that, you know, you can't give folic acid on its own. It has to be with B12 and B6 and there's other yeah. forms and just getting it all through ethics and things like that is a bit of a nightmare. So I can't imagine it changing anytime soon, um, but just know that it is a little bit harder to metabolize. You definitely want to have all the cofactors and um, you don't want to go too high a dose because it will start to saturate. And we are getting evidence for that now that it does saturate the enzymes. Hopefully that was helpful. I could talk about that all day. I'm trying to. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it is. It is. Uh, how would you approach uh, a patient, uh, let's say a postmenopausal female mm -hmm. who is on uh, several anti uh psychiatric drugs for depression, for, for all, of, all those things. And then who comes to our clinic. Now, let's not do uh, um, gene testing because uh, it's out of the question here. It's quite yeah. uh, pricey, okay? Yes. So in terms of supplementation, how are we going to approach this patient? Mm. And um, with, with a very little knowledge on those psychiatric drugs. How can we work hand in hand together with all those drugs that the patient is taking? Mm. Some of those drugs actually deplete B vitamins as well. Um, so I, I am not someone that gives a lot of S adenosyl methionine, SAMe, but I do know some practitioners tend to want to give SAMe alongside because it directly is giving the methyl groups. Mm -hmm. you, you just want to be very cautious with SAMe because you are coming in very high. Like, you know, we had someone ask about overmethylating. You know, if, if you come in with, with SAMe, you're really providing these methyl groups that can cause some imbalance around neurotransmitters, but some people respond really well. I get some patients that it's a lifesaver. They've actually been able to get off some of their anti-anxiety medication having SAMe. So, you know, thinking about that, I, I, the way that I practice though, is I tend to try to work through the B12, the folate, the B2, the BC or B complex. I give, I give what's needed from the pathway before the SAMe, but I do know there's practitioners in Australia that swear by SAMe. Do you give SAMe in the Philippines or in Hong Kong, if anyone's listening? Uh, rarely. Uh, mm. Actually, I have not. No, yeah, yeah. It's it's very common here. I think it's much more common in, in America, like in the United States. It's becoming popular here. Um, but the main thing is just thinking about um, from a nutrient perspective, you know, nutritional medicine is that they just don't have any deficiencies and that you know, some of the basics too, because magnesium and bees are really those basics, um, helping them deal with their neurotransmitters. And as I said, you know, the, the omega threes, but also, you know, it, it's, it's hard. There's so many different things, but trying to work out what, what is, what is the cause? You know, one thing I do with my patients, and you, you might do this too, sort of a functional medicine practice is looking at a timeline. You know, we will do a timeline of things that have led to whether it's an autoimmune disease diagnosis or the infertility or the diagnosis of a mental health condition. Like with the genetics, I think the level of understanding helps some people process things, even if it's not the DNA, maybe it's, oh yeah, I had, you know, this breakup or a car accident or this traumatic thing, or I had an infection, I think sometimes, you know, as human beings, 
we like to be able to piece things together and, and not just think we're crazy because sometimes when you think that you're just crazy and there's something wrong with you or no one can give you any answers that, you know, I know when I had my autoimmune condition at the start, I was very angry. I was playing the victim. I didn't understand why, you know, you get, you can get into a very, a, a, a not a very good mental state. I think I was in a very dark place for a while when I, I had Graves disease. Um, but I think for me anyway, I think having the understanding of the factors going, oh, okay, I was vitamin D deficient. I do have genetic susceptibility. This did happen. I had these things happen in my personal life. This is how I was, you know, I, I there were all these things and I was able to work through each of them. Um, it's definitely not easy with the complicated cases. Um, and I think the pandemic, unfortunately, as we all know, well, I'm guessing it's the same for you, has has made this much worse, much, much worse here in Australia. That's for sure. I'm guessing the same for you. Uh, we're down to the last question. I hope you don't mind, Dr. Denise. Yes. Uh, it's uh, about St. John's. Oh, yeah. Can you talk St. John's? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's definitely a popular one. Um Again, I don't give it a lot. And you obviously, if you're talking about, you know, patients being on medication, there's obviously a lot of contraindications with medication. But if someone's not on medication, um, this could be something, you know, not just St. John's wort, which we know has, has a lot of evidence, but even other adaptogens like rhodiola, ashwagandha, a lot of those things can actually be good too for just helping people regulate stress, helping with that sort of adrenal response as well. So the herbal medicine um, can be can be really helpful. And I, okay, hello, Sheena, so I see you there. I, oh, sorry, I was going to say, hello, Sheena, I see you there. Yes, you give Sammy. So she's in Hong Kong. I know Sheena, yeah. Hi, <laughs> Dr. Denise, how are you? I'm good, I'm good, hello. <laughs> Thank you for a wonderful talk. As That's right. You're, you're, a psychiat are you, you're a psychiatrist? I'm a psychologist, clinical psychologist. psychologist. Yeah. 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 In Hong Kong, that we, um, some of my patients have been prescribed um, Sam E. So they yeah. do prescribe here in Hong Kong. And, and success <laughs> with it, because I know there are practitioners in Australia that, have, that um, do try to use it to wean off some of the um, anti-anxiety psychotic medications? Mm. Well, um, I, if I recall correctly, I know someone was taking it with antidepressants. Mm. Just need to be a little bit cautious when you're having both mm. of them. But I guess if as long as they're working with the practitioner and you let the patients know they need to be monitored, you don't want them to go off and, you know, just right. start self-prescribing and doing these things. They just need to be checked. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. No worries. Thank you, everyone. Okay, so once again, uh, we thank you, Dr. Denise, for the wonderful evening. And uh, looking forward to the next one. Hope we could see you. We could listen to you face to face in the future. Yes, 2023. Yeah. yeah, and good luck with Prima, everyone. I'm sorry that I won't be speaking i'm off to um london my first overseas trip in two and a half years but i'm in london in a few weeks and have other events happening um but yeah i don't think we have anything planned you know by the time that all happens we're kind of wrapping up for the end of the year so uh i believe it'll be 2023 and i am yes yes rj uh yeah i'm really really hoping to see you all in person so have a lovely evening, everyone. And if you didn't catch the last talk and you want to know more about methylation or some of the side effects or the prescribing, remember that the last talk um, really did talk about dosages and supplements too. That might help with, with tonight's if you missed it. Right. Okay. Have a wonderful trip. Take good care. Thank yeah. you all. Thank Safe you. Travels, Denise. Bye. Bye. Bye.
encapsulations, Pure isn't just something we are. It's what we do. Clean, simple, goodness. It's a pure process with pure ingredients from start to finish. Each supplement is free from unnecessary additives and many common allergens. Because good starts with nutritional supplements that say what they do and do what they say. Our comprehensive line of supplements are built purposefully to support patient needs, from memory and mood to gastrointestinal and immune health. And it doesn't stop there. For 30 years, we've been committed to research, partnering with medical experts along the way. We've harnessed the science of nutrigenomics, worked hard to create a sustainable future, and improve the quality of life and health for children around the world. Because we believe when you do good, you feel good. That's goodness encapsulated.